Good evening, and welcome to the 22nd annual Democratic Town Committee of Chelmsford's Candidates Debate. I'm Sam Poulton. Members of the Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee are throughout the room. Uh, they will be circulating among you with little three by five cards. Uh, I would, uh, before beginning, I need to uh, give some thank yous because we've had a change of venue. We're usually thanking the uh, Chelmsford police, but uh, we are in these uh, beautiful new surroundings. Uh, I encourage everybody in town to come to the uh, Performing Arts Center and uh, come to the uh, cabaret, as they say. So uh, Joel Gray's not here, neither is Liza Minnelli, but uh, you can have a great time here at the uh, cabaret. I want to thank Sue Gates and the uh, Arts Council for uh, giving us this new venue. And wh who I really want to thank is Chelmsford Telemedia. A round of applause for them for setting up. The Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee is dedicated to good government. And in nonpartisan elections, we encourage people to get out and vote for the best candidate. And the best way to find the best candidate is to listen and watch and learn. That's why we do these debates. That's why I hope you're watching. So tonight, you'll have an opportunity to hear, in their own words, candidates for selectmen and school committee. And uh, for those of you that are here at the cabaret, we encourage you to write down questions. They will be unscreened. Uh, they uh, will only be edited for brevity. And uh, before we officially begin the debate, just a couple of things. Uh, first, I would like everyone to uh, join me in rising, and uh, we have a flag, and uh, I would like us to all stand and salute it, if you would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that for more than half of those 22 years, we've debated here in Chelmsford while townsmen, fellow Bay Staters, and people from all over the United States are deployed to defend the freedom that allows us to gather and debate our similarities and our differences. Please remember folks that are deployed. More importantly, remember their families. And uh, I am sure that you know someone that uh, belongs to a family of a deployed soldier. And uh, please let them know that uh, we think of them. And lastly, as painful as it is, and as unbelievable as it is, could we please have 30 seconds of silence for the horrific tragedy and the 17 people who were murdered in Parkland, Florida, high school students and staff. And um, let us join with others who are saying, never again, a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, we've all gone through a lot in the last couple of weeks, a lot of snow, and uh, we also have quite a flu epidemic uh, taking place. Uh, the snow has already canceled one debate. Uh, we decided not to cancel our debate tonight, instead to change venue. Uh, but we have uh, candidates who are under the weather and uh, who have gotten in touch with me. In fact, we're starting a little late, hoping that uh, one of them was feeling well enough uh, to join us. It's not the case right now. We have decided to uh, start with the Board of Selectmen candidates. And I will quickly, before we're joined, uh, go over uh, the rules for those in the audience. Uh, first, 
There'll be a two-minute opening statement. Then candidates will have three minutes to answer questions uh, from the audience. Uh, then ca questions candidate to candidate. And then another round of audience questions. And we'll do that for both uh, selectmen and school committee. Um, as I said, they will have um, two minutes to open, then one minute to close, and we'll begin with three minutes to answer questions, and we'll shorten that if we need to uh, save some time. The Chumster Democratic Town Committee meets on the last... See, I'm going to do a little late. Please turn off your cell phones <laughs> or put them on vibrate. The Chumster Democratic Town Committee meets, usually meets, the last Thursday of the month, 10 months of the year. Our usual meeting place is Princeton Station in uh, Chelmsford. In addition to Chelmsford Telemedia, this debate will be broadcast at various times between now and uh, the April 2nd. Is it April 2nd? April, the, April 3rd. It, I know that it's March 15th, April, the April 3rd town election, which is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in uh, April. So for those of you who are uh, watching us on Jump Street Telemedia, if you didn't get enough, tune to 980 WCAP, and we will publish the times when the debate will be rebroadcast. And for those of you in the room, feel free to visit our website at 980wcap.com. If uh, we could begin by having uh, the candidates for selectmen uh, join me here at the table. And uh, coming up, a round of applause for Emily Antle. A big round of applause. Unfortunately, both uh, George Dixon and Laura Merrill are under the weather, but uh, we uh, will encourage uh, Emily to take questions from the audience, an opening statement, a closing statement. And to uh, be fair, I do have an opening statement from Mr. Dixon, so uh, I am going to say that I am Thinking of a number. Oh, you can just go first. It's I'm okay. think. Oh no, no, no. We can't do that. I'm thinking of a number. Three. Between <laughs> one and ten. You know, between one and ten. Eleven. So you said what? Three. <laughs> All right. So you have uh, you have two minutes, and Mr. Kaplan will keep time for you. Uh, <laughs> candidate Emily Antle. <laughs> I'm Emily Antle. Uh, I have lived in Chelmsford for six years. I have two small children. I'm a native of Massachusetts. I grew up in Winchester. Um, <clears throat> I attended college in Western Mass. Uh, I love my neighborhood. It is, I, I live in a Norman Rockwell painting, basically. It's uh, <laughs> of the park. Um, I have a library. I have a bus driver and a postman and a nurse and a, it's 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 mr rogers neighborhood too it's it's um it's amazing um it's the verney park area it's just it's phenomenal and i love it so much i love my neighbors um i uh i taught school for many years i taught public school i do have some experience with private and charter schools as well um i also did project management for a textbook translating company, and I managed teams in Argentina and Colombia, uh, as well as um, uh, freelancers around this country. And uh, is that better? Okay. Um, and I'm losing my voice because I have whatever cold is going around too, but. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm running for the Board of Selectmen because I'm really good at seeing the bigger picture, uh, breaking projects down into smaller pieces, 
uh, and making sure those pieces get completed and followed through on time. Um, so I think that I can bring focus. I think that I can bring drive. I think that I can bring ideas and structure to the Board of Selectmen. Um, I like to work with people, so I absolutely would welcome collegiality and uh, uh, a team spirit on the Board of Selectmen uh, to help move projects forward. Thank you very much, Laura. All right, I have an opening statement uh, from Selectman George Dixon, and um, I'm not used to uh, something high tech. Uh, I finally got a phone that doesn't flip, so I'm going to uh, read the statement as, as George uh, sent it. As a lifetime, uh, lifelong resident, George Dixon Jr. has served the town of Chelmsford with pride in many capacities. His most visible contribution to the town of Chelmsford is his current role as a member of the Board of Selectmen, now in his third term. His favorite part of being a Selectman is when he gets a, call, a phone call from someone who needs help, no matter what it is, and he's able to solve the issue on their behalf. Nothing gives him more pleasure. In this role, George has served as a liaison to a number of departments, Lowell Regional Transit Authority, Permanent Building Committee, Water Departments, Capital Planning Committee, just to name a few. The hottest topic this election season, however, is tax classification, an option that works successfully in nearby communities. With the new Route 129 business overlay and the fact big companies have left Chelmsford for locations with higher tax rates, George wants to explore a new tax rate, currently dollar for dollar split, that makes sense for both residents and businesses. In addition to his work serving the town, George helps kids with disabilities at the Paul Center, serving on a number of committees and fundraising initiatives and even teaching kids to bowl. He's an active member of his church, extending his commitment and faith to community service. For the Boys and Girls Club, he lends golf skills to help teach the kids and his community experience to fundraising efforts. In addition, he was a primary leader in the effort to install synthetic turf athletic fields in Chelmsford. He is a recent inductee to the Chelmsford High School Hall of Fame. George is running for re-election to his fourth term to the Chelmsford Board of Selectmen. He has proven his commitment to serving the town well, representing the residents time and again, and asks for everyone's vote on Tuesday, April 3rd. Those are George Dixon's words, not mine. Round of applause for both candidates and their opening statements. I will now say that uh, Laura Merrill, uh, currently serving on the Board of Selectmen, was unable to be with us. She gave me permission to say she is down with the flu. And I think we all understand that not only is that uncomfortable, uh, I think that discretion was the better part of valor, and we have to thank her for keeping that to herself. Uh, so a round of applause for uh, Laura Merrill. Okay, with the uh, opening statements out of the way, and the fact that we only have one candidate who can answer questions, I'm going to begin asking the questions that have already been brought up. And please, uh, Joe and others have uh, three by five cards. If you guys could walk around and get more questions, that would be, uh, that would be great. First question, and you'll have three minutes to answer. Okay. There is about a $40,000 difference between the compensation package for the superintendent and town manager. What do you think about that discrepancy? Who is paid more? I think they purposely left that out. Superintendent. The superintendent is paid more to the town manager. Um, Well, I think that when you're looking at a budget, uh, if any sacrifices are to be made, then they have to be made fairly and across the board. And I would never approve uh, a raise for 
um, administrators and administration if the rank and file were not also getting a raise. And I would never approve a raise when programs are being cut. Um, in terms of what the jobs are, in terms of what the jobs are worth, It seems to me that the town manager's salary is fair. Uh, the superintendent, if that is the salary, sounds a bit high. So, um, and it's not that Dr. Lang doesn't care and doesn't do an excellent, excellent job. He clearly cares deeply. He's an excellent listener. He, um, I, I, I just question when schools are feeling pinched for funding and superintendents have high salaries. And I think that, I mean, I know that if I were in that position, I would make a good faith gesture and cut my salary. But um, as Board of Selectmen, if I have a say over it, then I would be voting to either maintain or reduce it unless uh, funding were raised proportionally to the schools. So, um, that is my opinion. All right. Thank you, Emily. Let's get right to it. What is your stance on tax classification? I am for tax classification. Good Would answer. you like me to elaborate? <laughs> Do you want to elaborate at all, or? I mean, I, uh, so as the wife of a small business owner uh, who is intimately familiar with the ups and downs of a uh, first, second, third year business, we just had our third year anniversary and we are planning a rather major expansion. Um, I know that small businesses are always given easements. So this is not a question of small businesses uh, going further into the red in their early years when they are either not profitable or barely breaking even. Uh, they are always given easements. Um, it's a standard practice. Uh, when you are looking to fill the shoes left by Kronos, which is a multinational corporation, when you are looking to fill the significant real estate on the 129 overlay, you are looking at multinational corporations. They do not care about a few percentage points in tax differences at all. They don't care. And what you want in a strong, healthy economy is a mix of small and large business. You want mom and pop stores, you want multinationals, and if we want to attract those, what we need are amenities. Kronos left uh, not because of taxes. They left because they wanted a single building where they could exist as a corporation with room to grow, and they didn't have it where they were. So if you want to fill those shoes, if you want to fill that space, the question is amenities, and that is up to the owner and to the developers of the properties to ensure that the buildings are up to date, that uh, there is a, an appropriate work-life balance in the area, uh, that uh, there is accessibility to transportation, that there are uh, a, a, a variety of amenities around, whether that is gyms, uh, restaurants, and a variety of restaurants, not just a couple of you know big boxes, but a variety of restaurants, uh, that there is space to grow, that there is uh, adequate space to live, and the buildings have to be updated. And I feel like we're in a bit of a catch-22 right now where you've got uh, uh, owners of these buildings who haven't updated, who don't want to update because they don't have tenants, and tenants who don't want to move in because the buildings aren't updated. And so we are in a bit of a, um, a struggle there. But uh, the taxes don't have anything to do with that at all when you look at comparable communities who are close enough to Chelmsford to be considered peers. If, if I might. Um Absolutely. At, as the moderator. Absolutely. Uh, I th we all appreciate your answer. I, I want to give you an opportunity to, cl to um, clarify. You said you were in favor of, of classification. Uh, are you in favor of one tax rate for residential and business, or are you in favor of two different rates? Oh, two different ones. I'm sorry. Two different ones. So you want, um, I assume... Businesses would carry... Uh, a nominally higher percentage. Um, so, 
Okay, that, I mean, yeah. that, that clarifies it. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, we're now that uh, all the candidates have answered a couple of questions with three minutes. We have a lot more questions than I thought we would get from the audience with more coming, so I'm going to limit the response to two minutes. Absolutely. All right. Rate the town manager's performance, if you will, specifically. What do you believe Mr. Cohen does well? And give us one area in which he needs to improve. Paul Cohen is uh, the errand man for the Board of Selectmen. If you have a problem with what he's doing, then that's a problem with the board, because his whole job is to do exactly what the board tells him. So if you don't like what Paul is doing, it may be a problem with the board. It may be a problem with a lack of teamwork, with a lack of focus, and a lack of vision on the board that perhaps Paul is not getting clear signals on what he should be focusing on. If you want him to change his focus, you have to ensure that the board knows what you want the board to do. That, that is, so uh, Paul Cohen is, uh, again, another outstanding listener. He uh, takes time to respond to phone calls and emails. Uh, he's very quick to respond to those. Um, I know that being a good listener does not mean always being good at following through, but I have had no issues with Paul in terms of you know any matter I have brought to him. Uh, any fault in his performance, I think, comes back to the board because the board tells him what to do. He, he is there. Um, he does what... He's their avatar. <laughs> he gets things done. He, they tell him what to do, and he goes and does it. He's, he doesn't make the decisions, so he can't be held responsible for them. All right. Thank you very much. How do you feel about re regionalization of services, specifically regionalization of dispatchers? Oh, I was not anticipating that specific one. Um, in terms of uh, 911 dispatchers, this came up uh, my first term on town meeting. There was a vote on that, and I'm having trouble remembering the specifics around the numbers. Um, I would need to look at those numbers again. I, I do remember this coming up in my first town meeting, and it was uh, an interesting thing that I hadn't thought about. I think the, the benefit to having localized dispatchers in terms of services is that uh, they might know the town better and be better able to understand uh, street addresses. For example, I don't know if uh, localized dispatchers necessarily come from the area, but that would be my assumption. Um, but it depends. I mean, you know, certainly a region like the Merrimack Valley, I was, I was expecting water <laughs> for that one. Um, I, I think some services could be perhaps improved by having a regionalized one. It may be more cost effective. Uh, certainly there are cities out there with uh, larger footprints that have uh, what could be termed a regional service provider, so it would depend. Uh, I would need to see the numbers. I would need to see what the, the benefits are and what the cost savings are. Um, I certainly wouldn't want a national call center somewhere in another state dealing with this. I wouldn't want, you know, that level of, of distance. So um, I think it depends on the, on the numbers that are coming through and what studies have been done. Thank you. Do you support allowing retail marijuana sales in Chelmsford? Yes. I do believe that's been hashed out. So, uh, oh, oh, that was, that was not an intended pun. <laughs> All right, so, yeah. Um. <laughs> that may be the high point of the night. I've got to remember that marijuana sales have been hashed out. Ah. <laughs> Anyone got a Twitter account? Put that out there. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Because 
It's tax revenue. You want tax relief, you want more tax base, bring in the marijuana, bring in the sales because those are regulated. They are not coming in from our national forests where cartels are growing them with unregulated amounts of pesticides. Bring in the greenhouses, which will allow farmers to grow them. Uh, bring in the medical uh, testing, bring in the science labs, bring in the microbiology around it, or the microbotany around it, bring in the double-blind clinical research trials. Absolutely, let's go science. Let's figure out what the molecules are, let's figure out what the strains are, let's get this down and regulated, and let's get the quality control in there, let's get Let's do it and let's make some money off of it because that would be the front of the crest. It is going to peak. And if we wait, everyone else is gonna get the peak, they're gonna get all the infrastructure, and we are going to be looking at, you know, the 51st iteration of the shop, which is not gonna make nearly as much as the first, second, and third. So I wanna be at the front of that wave. So yes, um, absolutely. I am absolutely pro-regulation and science and research. Thank you. At this point, to give you a little breather, we have invited members of the press, and uh, I recognize one member of the press, and uh, I don't know if the Lowell Sun reporter has found the uh, cabaret at the uh, Chelmsford uh, Performing Arts Center or not. If uh, you are here, Lowell Sun, Lowell's great newspaper, uh, raise your hand. Um, I, I do recognize one of our on-air people from 980 WCAP, and um, I will call on uh, Joe Reddy to ask a question on behalf of the radio station. Um, would you support a tax override to build a new high school in Chelmsford? Would you support a tax override to build a new high school in It depends Chelsea? on whether or not we got matching grants from the state. I know we turned down matching grants several years ago, uh, which I think was a poor decision. Um, if we could get into that grant pool where we got matching funds, uh, I, I think we need it. I know that uh, windows have been updated. I know the HVAC system has been updated. I also know that those buildings are not in any kind of condition interior, and it's speaking about the interior, to, to uh, serve the purpose they need to at this point. Um, so, and I also know that, that the reason we put those modular classrooms out there, which I really felt was the only decision. I voted for that because that was the only realistic decision. I also thought it was just an absurd decision to make. I thought it was a bad one. Um, and we did, we did that because we didn't want to open the walls and get slapped with code regulations on these old buildings that were not updated and were not adequately maintained. And because the buildings were not regularly updated and not maintained, it is now more expensive to rebuild and so the problem with um, passing the buck or kicking the can down the road, whatever metaphor you would like, is that sooner or later it has to stop and you have to pay the bill, you have to pick the can up, and you have to do something about it. And I, I'm sorry if it feels like a big pinch now, it would have been cheaper years ago, it would have been cheaper to maintain it in the long run. And um, I, I don't like decisions that are better in the short term and worse in the long term. I try to avoid those in my personal life. I realize that sometimes that is your only option, like with the modular classrooms, but that was the, um, the end of a series of very bad decisions. So I, as, as a person who can see the big picture, I would much rather be looking at the long-term future of the town and the up-and-coming town townies and members of the town and people who will be using the infrastructure that has not been well maintained and has not been updated. And that is what I am looking for. I am looking for current and future town members who will need good infrastructure, who will need updated buildings. This is a great example for an updated building that, has, that is serving a new purpose. If you look around at all the work put into this building here at the Chelmsford Center for the Arts, you can see how uh, maintenance and upgrading brings in revenue and status and benefits to the town. And it would do that if we updated and maintained our schools. Thank you. How do you feel about housing growth in the town? Do you feel the CEO ID should be revised to reduce density? 
No, I think that density needs to be planned. I think that when you don't have a master plan and a master vision with concrete goals, you end up with haphazard density. You end up with uh, a poor work-life balance. You end up with losing green space. Planned density allows uh, preservation and conservation of green space. It allows that open green space in the community where the community can gather and socialize and, and really feel a part of something. My neighborhood is such a great example of that. Uh, the, the lots are a little smaller than in some areas, but I love my neighbors. I love their dogs. Um, really, <laughs> even the noisy ones, I love them. I love the park in my neighborhood. I love uh, the fact that my kids are able to, or will be once they're tall enough, to be able to run around you know, within, within an area like I used to when I was a kid. I, it's a great neighborhood with, with, with fabulous people. And when you plan density well, when you plan for a life-work balance, when you look at the possibilities around Vinyl Square for growth and development and, and just tremendous possibilities, that's, that's what you need to be looking at. You need to be looking at walkability. You need to be looking at spur at the, the spur um, for the uh, Lowell Line commuter rail that they're considering um, in North Chelmsford. That's on the, the Warren articles, I believe, for the Springtown meeting. And that, that is, is, a tr is, is a wonderful opportunity for economic growth and development. And so planning density is absolutely necessary. Uh, you, um, it, it's happening. The world's population is growing. It's not shrinking. And you cannot freeze time. You can't freeze space. And uh, I'm sure this argument was had years ago when the pig farms started disappearing. Um, and I married into a family with a pig farm, so I know what that looks like too. Um, and at some point, you get the sprawl out there and the growth and development because the population is going to double within the next few decades. So. Thank you. We have a uh, question from the audience. All of these are from the audience. We have a question that's a follow-up to uh, your answer about classification. Okay. What is the definition in your mind of small business regarding the tax rate? That is, how many employees and uh, what uh, how, and the number of properties, size of properties, uh, make something a small business. Uh, this person is asking for a definition. I don't know. Um, maybe ballpark under a million in in profit. I worked in uh, so I went to college at Smith in Northampton, and I worked off campus um, every year I could. I spent a year abroad, so obviously I wasn't working in Spain, but um, the, the company, so Northampton was really great because it had a ton of unique businesses. It was thriving, it was booming. Um, the recessions have hit it and it's, it's not as amazing as it used to be. Um, but the, the company I worked for, the, the store I worked for, was just about at a million dollars worth of business and it was a tiny hole in the wall. It was, you know, the size of this room with the, the like half this room with the columns. Um, so uh, it depends on what it is. I, there are guidelines for small businesses in terms of who has to provide health care. Perhaps we could follow that. So if you have, you know, under whatever number of employees, you don't have to pay the higher rate. But like I said as well, um, I, I I don't think taxes are a black and white issue. I don't think that you can universally apply uh, single numbers to a broad base of people. You can't have, this, this flat tax rates are ridiculous and don't work and data has proven that. You need graded tax rates. And so if we have a small business tax rate and a big business tax rate, I think that's reasonable and justifiable. And I think that we have data to prove that and it bears out from uh, around the country and around the world. Right, thank you. And uh, our last, um, actually we have two questions left. I'm gonna ask you to answer um, uh, one very briefly so we can ask the second one. Okay. And um, the Chumpsford Center for the Arts is an unfunded mandate, beautiful building uh, of the town. What support, if any, would you advocate the town give it? Um, well, I think that it would be, uh, 
I, I believe that this sort of thing is usually done with a written request. So depending on the written request, depending on the budget, depending on Susan's needs to keep this running, uh, this is an asset to the town. We have it on cover photos. Uh, we, it is frequently featured in art and photographs uh, that are posted on town web pages representing the town. It is right in the center. It is highly visible. It brings in uh, 70 concerts a year, something like that, 60, 70 concerts a year. This, this is the sort of thing that you want to promote, particularly in a town like Chelmsford that values its music program so highly as highly as Chelmsford does, uh, that values its art programs as highly as Chelmsford does. I think that we forget about the importance of culture and creativity and hobbies. I think that we are so focused on logging in hours to desk jobs that we forget that people love to have hobbies and they need them. My husband's bar was built by a lawyer who happens to woodwork in his free time. He is a master craftsman level woodworker because it relieves stress from dealing with law all day. Our tables and chairs were built by that lawyer. I worked in a school with a janitor who had been in a seven to nine piece polka band playing saxophone for 40 years. How many kids graduating today are looking at a 40 year hobby with the same seven to nine people in a music band. This, this is what this place is for. You need these places in communities and they bring life to communities. They bring destinations. And I know my time is up and I'm the only one up here and I don't have to respond to anyone right now. So I'm just gonna run over a little bit because uh, when you look at people coming in to see concerts, they, they can walk to restaurants. They can spend time on the green for daytime concerts. They could bring a picnic and go to a concert. There are kids' concerts held here. This is the sort of thing that all towns should be promote, promoting and children should be looking at as things to do. They can paint and they can sell their paintings for thousands of dollars if somebody wants to buy them. It is an opportunity to showcase what makes us human <laughs> and, and what is so important about us as a species as opposed to just worker drones, which I think um, we value too highly sometimes. Right, thank you and uh, a quick yes or no. Would you be in favor of changing the charter to remove the town manager with three votes instead of the current four vote rule? Um, I mean, I don't see why a simple majority um, is a problem. I do think that there would need to be a thorough review. Uh, I have heard that the, uh, the review process for evaluating the town manager is not nearly as thorough as the review process that I went through as a teacher, which I find rather appalling because I had to fill out in the last few years 20 to 30 pages of responses on a, an evaluation. I had to submit documentation. So if we can't judge a town manager the way we can judge a teacher, I think that's a problem. So I would love to know what the process is for reviewing. And again, I don't have a problem with Paul Cohen. And again, he is the gopher for the Board of Selectmen. If you have a problem with Paul Cohen, you might have a problem with the Board of Selectmen, which is why you should consider me. But um, so uh, I, I think a you know, three out of five is fine. I just want to know what the review process is, because if it is less stringent <coughs> for a town manager than for a teacher, I think there's a problem with the process. <laughs> All right, and uh, a last press question uh, from uh, 980 WCAP, Joe Reddy. Mr. Reddy, nice and loud, please. Uh, what committees would you be most interested in serving on as a liaison if elected? Well, I think I am more qualified than anyone on the board to serve on the school committee because of my experience. Um, I also think that I would be good for uh, um, anything dealing with the green spaces. I know we don't have a parks and rec department, um, so, which I think is a, a, I think is a fault. <laughs> 
I think it's a fault, but I think I think open space would be a good place for me. I think that um, school committee, obviously, uh, with my background. Um, I mean, I would see, people always ask about waste. I've served on accreditation teams. I know how to read a budget for a school, and I would see any waste quickly. So um, I think those would be my preferences, would be maybe open space and, uh, and the school committee. But it certainly depends on, on what is needed, you know? All right, thank you very much. And uh, if you can answer this in uh, one minute, that way we'll have asked every single question that was sent up. Yes. Do you have any strategies to help reduce residents' costs of living in town? Uh, I don't think it means their personal budgets. I mean, is there any way that you, any strategies you have to make it less expensive to live in the town of Chelmsford? Um, I believe there's some sort of program whereby, someone was telling me about this just today, there's, there's a program whereby seniors can do volunteer work to get their tax bills reduced. Um, I don't know. I would like to see where our revenue streams are and how they compare to other, uh, to other towns and to see whether or not we are accessing the revenue streams that a town of this size typically accesses. So if we are not, if there are new revenue streams we could be exploring, I would like to know about that. Um, I would like to hear what uh, I would like to hear what the other selectmen have to say on that. I would like to hear what um, Lisa Maroney, the the director of um, the the I'm going to get the title wrong, and I'm so sorry. My apologies, but uh, it's it's the new economic development director position. I would like to hear what her input might be, um, and I would like to see how our revenue streams compare with other towns. Thank you very much. It's now time for. Uh, closing statements, and uh, in as much as um, you went first, Mr. Dixon will go first in the close. Okay. George Dixon wants to emphasize again that he is committed to the town of Chelmsford and enjoys serving the residents as their representative on the Board of Selectmen. One thing he would like to encourage is that more people become involved in activities uh, that impact the broader community. There are many committees to join, interesting meetings to attend, and good things happening in Chelmsford that would benefit from new participants. George has lived in Chelmsford his entire life so far, and as a member of the Board of Selectmen, he has proven his commitment to addressing issues large and small. George asks you to vote for him on Tuesday, April 3rd, so he can serve another term for the good of our town. A round of applause to uh, our two candidates who are here in voice and, for, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, there you go. How easy is it for a moderator to only moderate one candidate? <laughs> Not easy enough for this moderator, obviously. <laughs> Will thou hear? from uh, Emily. I'm Emily Antle. Um, I would greatly appreciate the opportunity to serve the town of Chelmsford on the Board of Selectmen. I, I believe that I can bring focus and direction to it. I believe that my ability to identify goals in things like vision statements and to make them concrete and to break down tasks into small parts and actually follow through and get them done would help. Uh, I, I'm working for current residents and future residents, and I believe that I have a lot to offer Chelmsford. Um, I also would like to echo what George wrote in about more people serving. We need more voter turnout. We need more people involved. We need more people contributing because this is a community and this is your community and this is why I'm running. I believe that more people need to participate, and it is, it is actually a little difficult for me to put myself out there like this, and it is a little difficult for me to go door knocking and shake hands and ask for signatures. So if I can do it, you can too. And I look forward to a, a voter turnout. Please make sure you bring your friends, and please vote for me, Emily Antle, on April 3rd. Thank you. And once again, Laura Merrill is a candidate for re-election, 
And uh, Laura was unable to join us, uh, being down with the flu. Uh, I know that were Laura here, one thing is certain. She would ask for your vote on April 3rd. So on her behalf, I would say, please remember to go out and vote Tuesday, April 3rd. And Laura Merrill would like you to consider her. Now we can say a big round of applause for our candidates, especially the candidate that's been grilled. So. <laughs> We're going to move right into um, the uh, school committee. And while the school committee candidates uh, come on up, thank you very much, Emily. Thank you very much. A uh, couple of things we want to mention while we're live. And, uh, <laughs> and that is the Friends of Roberts Field is now offering the next generation of playground users the limited opportunity to buy a personalized engraved brick Inside a new pathway at Friendship Park Playground, all proceeds to benefit the playground. The campaign ends April 30th, so buy a brick today. Visit friendsofrobertsfield.org slash buy a brick. They are as inexpensive as $50. Uh, I would also remind everyone that there will be a march on March 24th, Saturday, 2 p.m. in Chelmsford Center, a march for safety in, uh, to honor and remember the 17 victims at Parkland High School. Uh, the details are still being worked out, but please save the date, March 24th, Saturday, 2 p.m., on the common, there'll be some brief speakers, mostly students, and um, that um, will be followed by a march. That's Saturday, March 24th. And um, if the candidates would indulge me for one moment, we have a, a little technical check-in. And uh, I hope that uh, everyone who is watching will put up with this. Uh, does anybody have anything they would like to promote in the 60 seconds it's going to take me to walk to the back of the room and come back? Maybe, uh, maybe Joe has something good to say. Well, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, all those interested in uh, learning more about Chelmsford topics, you can tune in to Town Talk on Monday nights, uh, airs at 8.30. Uh, Dennis and I do a show on WCAP 980 on Wednesdays, 10 to 11, if anyone's interested in Chelmsford topics. And if you're interested in discussing Chelmsford topics, you can go on to our uh, Facebook website, uh, Chelmsford Town Talk. Uh, everyone's welcome to join. Feel free to join and, uh, and discuss. All right, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Reddy. Uh, Town Talk's an excellent uh, program. There's another excellent program uh, with Dennis and Joe, and that's every Wednesday at 10 a.m. on 980 WCAP. Uh, a lot different than, than uh, the uh, cable TV show, and uh, really outstanding. Very few father-son teams in the Merrimack Valley, and they're really very good. All right, for our order of speaking and answering, we'll do the same as we did for the uh, selectmen. I am thinking hard <laughs> of a number <laughs> between one and 10. Uh, what number? We'll start with uh, the candidate closest to me. Seven. Four. I don't know. We're in a room of psychics, obviously. This has never happened. So, there we are. Seven. They usually, it's usually the person who's closest. So we had, well, I've got to remember. I think everybody has to play those numbers. Play three and 
seven. Okay, it is soon to be a distinct honor. I don't want to get our names wrong, and I should not have buried my cards, which I did. It is a uh, distinct honor and privilege to introduce our two candidates for school committee. So let's begin with a round of applause for Jamie Outland Brown and Donna Newcomb. A round of applause, please. <laughs> and uh, Jamie uh, chose number seven. So uh, she will begin. Uh, we will then rotate with the questions. And uh, I will begin the school committee uh, uh, debate the same way we began the selectmen's debate. I'm Sam Poulton, chair of the uh, Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee, who along with 980 WCAP is sponsoring tonight's uh, debate, our Meet the Candidates. And uh, we wanna thank the Chelmsford uh, Center for the Arts for giving us this beautiful space, the Chelmsford Cabaret, uh, we also want to thank Chelmsford Telecommunications. Round of applause for Chelmsford Telecommunications. <laughs> the uh, candidates, those of you that came out in person, and those of you that are listening at home, we are live on uh, Chelmsford Cable Access. It will be, uh, the show will be repeated a number of times. Consult your local listings. We're also uh, going to be broadcast on 980 WCAP many times between now and April 3rd. Uh, 980 WCAP, as well as the Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee, is committed to promoting good government. In Chelmsford, uh, local elections are nonpartisan. We encourage people to always vote for the candidate who will do best for our town. We think the best way to decide that is to listen, watch, make up your mind, and surely vote. So with that said, Jamie, you have a two minute opening statement. Thank you, sir. I'd just like to say thank you for this opportunity to come out here and speak to the people of the town of Chelmsford. Appreciate everyone who's come out here tonight to actively participate in this great and wonderful event that we have and are able to do. My name is Jamie Outland Brown and I am a candidate for the Chelmsford School Committee. I was born in Arizona. Um, however, when people ask me where are you from, I always say all over because my mom didn't like to sit still very long. So she moved around a lot. I actually went to 12 different schools before I even got to high school. So um, I find, my mom did finally settle down in Baltimore where I graduated. I tried to do a couple of years of college and then I joined the army. Um, Hua. Cool. My original plan was to do college with the ROTC program and then join the army. However, I failed the physical with my vision and couldn't get the scholarship. So God had another plan, had to join a little bit early. But I always knew since the sixth grade I was going to join the Army and I was going to serve this country. And I did it till the day the, the Army said I could serve no more. I did it proudly and with honor every single day. Even on those days when you're cold and hungry and wet and miserable and tired and you miss your friends and your family and you haven't seen anybody in forever, I still knew I was serving a greater purpose. And that was okay with me. And then when I became a leader, the soldiers that I had under me, my responsibility to make sure that they came home safely, and I was okay with that. That's what I joined for. After joining, after, uh, while in the Army, I, um, you know, escalated to senior level leadership. I made my Master Sergeant in 15 years, a little, a little over 15 years. I did m numerous uh, leadership courses, um, educational training. I was a military police officer, so I did a lot of, have a lot of experience in, in security, force protection, and those type of details as well. Um, and I, but I have a, a great level of secu uh, experience in leadership, senior level leadership, managing multiple um, skill sets, and personalities to get people to come together to work to a team. Um, after I retired, um, my husband's still in the Army, so we moved to Hawaii. 
uh, Uncle Sam decided we deserved paradise, so that's where he sent us for a few years. And while we were there, we started, we extended our family, and I had two more children, my uh, beautiful little girls. So now I have three, my son, Wyatt, who's eight, my middle child, Olivia, who is four, and my youngest, Isabel, is two. Everyone just had their birthday in February, so we've just upped a number. So all my kids are all born in the same. Uh, after, after Hawaii, Army said, you're moving to Massachusetts. We said, great. So looked around. We picked Chelmsford because of the schools, because of its crime rate or lack thereof, and because of their, um, the property values. We picked Chelmsford. I have been driven to serve everywhere and every day of my life. And this is why I'm choosing to serve now in my community, the community we're going to make home and we're going to stay at. So this is why I've chosen to be join and serve the community of, select, of Chelmsford School District community. Thank you very much. Donna Newcomb. Um, thank you, and I'd like to thank uh, Sam and the Democratic Committee for um, sponsoring this debate tonight. Uh, my name is Donna Newcomb. I've been a resident of Chelmsford for 20 years. I reside at 16 Janet Road with my children, uh, Jack and Emma. I am a Westfield State University graduate. I began my career as a special education teacher at the Lighthouse School and worked there for 18 years. I received, while I was there, my master's degree in rehabilitation counseling from uh, Boston University. I currently work as a special education teacher at Lowell High School. Um, one of my passions, besides teaching, is also to volunteer with the Outdoor Adventure Club. And this club is designed to help inner city kids be able to be explore the outdoors. Um, some of the community activities that I have been involved in include um, teaching religious education at St. Mary's, coaching youth basketball and field hockey, and I was also a Girl Scout leader. I served on the uh, Community Preservation Committee, and I am currently a member of the Board of Trustees for the library, as well as a town meeting representative for Precinct 9. I was actively involved in the um, South Row PTO, the Chelmsford High PTO, uh, School Council, and the Council of Schools. I am the co-founder of the Initiative for Local Aid, um, for uh, which we uh, worked on increasing uh, local aid to municipalities uh, throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin our questions from the audience, we have two candidates, and I would point out that uh, there is only one open seat. And uh, on behalf of the Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee, uh, I want to thank uh, Sal Lapoli for his three years on the uh, school committee. Uh, Sal, it appeared that Sal was going to run, but uh, he decided uh, not to seek re-election. Thus, uh, our two women are uh, vying for an open seat. Uh, only one can be elected. So uh, what we're going to do now is take questions from the audience, questions from uh, the press, from 980 WCAP or any other member of the press. And because you're both here, we're going to have a round of uh, candidate to candidate question, uh, which makes this a bit of a debate. Uh, we're going to limit answers to two minutes. And uh, in as much as uh, Jamie went first with her opening statement, uh, the first person to answer will be Donna. And uh, our first question is, How do you feel about charter schools? <laughs> Easy, right out of the gate. <laughs> um, I, I like the concept of charter schools. I like um, the, uh, the idea that students should uh, be able to find a school that best suits their learning needs. Uh, my concern with the charter schools remains um, the level of accountability that they are held to. Um, I think that um, if we are to continue um, developing charter schools, that one of the things that we need to look at is the standards that we have for their teachers, uh, for um, in terms of licensure, um, and um, other standards around learning, um, uh, assessment, um, graduation requirements, and things like this. So um, while I am, as I said, uh, in favor of providing a variety of learning opportunities for students, I also think that we need to take a very close look at how it is uh, that we are um, 
uh, you know, measuring the success of charter schools and the standards that we hold them to. Thank you. Jamie? Does the school committee have authority over the charter schools in Chelmsford? I think the intent no. of the question was to get your opinion on okay. charter schools. Okay, now I just I, I just want to make sure I wasn't misinformed on my own research. So, <laughs> okay, so um, you know, as, I mean, not that it affects our position as a school committee member because we don't have any effect on the charter schools. But yes, I believe that whatever an educational opportunity is available that best fits the student should be our primary focus, right? We as a one school system cannot, we, as much as we want to attempt to, sometimes we cannot reach every single student. So we have a charter school where that can reach a student, then they should be here. I agree with Donna that there does need to be proper regulation and they can't be going out there doing whatever they want. They have to be held to the same standards, mm -hmm. same accountability. But if they're going to give what, the te what that student needs to be successful, then let's do it. Thank you. Jamie, you'll answer first on this. What approach would you take to create unity among the uh, school board members? Uh, I think this is a timely question. Definitely need to do some team building events with the individuals on the board and wash away whatever uh, personal issues there are and realize that even though we may not, you may not like each other personally, you have to be able to work professionally. We have a mission to do as a school committee. And then even in the Army, there were plenty of people that I had to work with that I personally didn't really care for. But we have to work professionally as a community to get the job done. Thank you. Donna? Um, I think that um, I think that there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed um, on the school committee. Um, I think the place to start is um, understanding uh, what the purpose is and refocusing our priorities uh, where it should be, which is on the students, and uh, providing the teachers with all the resources they need in order to be able to provide students with the best possible education. I think that we need to review uh, what the mission of the school committee is. Uh, what the, the mandates are, um, what they can and can't do. I think we need to take a hard look at our policies and make sure that we're following those policies um, as school committee members. Um, I think that we need to uh, bring back civility and decorum and professionalism to our meetings. I think we have to adopt um, an attitude of approachability, um, transparency, and uh, reestablish the credibility that I think that has been lost over the last several months. Thank you. Okay. Donna, you'll go first on this. Given the most recent event in Florida, what's your position on keeping students safe, specifically your thoughts on the ATLAS procedure? I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think that this is probably, as an educator, one of the things that uh, is so stunningly stressful. Um, I recently said that, uh, you know, I started teaching 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, this kind of thing was not anything that we ever thought we would be dealing with. And yet today, here we are trying to figure out um, how to keep our students safe uh, from um, unintended intruders. Um, I'm glad that the uh, school committee um, and the superintendent have um, allocated funds for the ALICE training. And uh, the ALICE training um, is an options-based training and it stands for um, alert, um, lock down, inform, confront, and evacuate. Uh, this gives um, staff um, resources and options available to them because sometimes, for example, the, the best course of action may be to evacuate your students and at other times it may be to lock down. I think one of the other things that we really have to do is uh, we really have to um, do a safety assessment of all of our buildings and make sure that uh, the things are in place um, in the hallways, common areas, cafeterias, gymnasiums, um, and lecture halls uh, to make sure that, um, you know, that they're properly supervised and, uh, that, um, and that there's uh, not any opportunity for, um, for someone uh, to come into the school and uh, to commit a very heinous and, and uh, unfortunate act. 
Um, the other thing I think that we need to do is we really need to talk to the teachers. They know their classrooms best. They know their students best. They know what age groups they work with. They understand how they respond in um, crisis situations. We need to make sure that the teachers have all of the tools and the resources that they need in order to be able to either shelter in place or to be able to um, evacuate safely. And there's a lot of things out there right now, and I think that the school committee will be wise to take a look at what those resources are and to provide them for the teachers. Thank you. I don't think any reasonable person, if you ask them with the, about the safety concerns of our children, if it's important or not, would say no. Yes, the safety of our children are, should be one of the utmost of important. My experience as a law enforcement officer in dealing with force protection and protection and, and, and providing security, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. I have a great level of experience in how to incorporate or establish proper security procedures and protocols and to look at facilities and say, hey, we're lacking, this is, this is a weak area in our security, this is a weak area in our perimeter, or we need to increase our procedural aspects in this area because it can be exploited. Um, I, I think Alice is a good option based on age appropriateness. Again, you, you teachers obviously will make the assessment, do, can we evacuate? It depends on the building as well as where, where the assailant is. So, but the, the, com the confront part always seemed a little concerning to me because I don't think I want to teach first graders to confront an assailant. So again, I know that's not how it's, it's, it's does modified at each level, um, but yes, it should be an option. I don't think just barricading yourself in is necessarily the best option if you can in fact evacuate the building. Uh, leaving the scene as safely as possible so you're no longer at risk or a liability is usually the best option. Thank you. You're tuned to Chelmsford Telecommunications and 980 WCAP. This is the uh, Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee candidates debate. And um, we now have many more questions from the audience. And um, <laughs> Jamie, you're going to be first with this one. The question is, how would you rate Dr. Lang's performance? What's the one thing he does well? And uh, what's the one thing he could approve upon. I think most people in here in Chelmsford would agree Dr. Lang pulled the school committee out of a red hole. Our budget was in the negative when he came on board and he was able to, using his business degree, help facilitate uh, proper money management um, along with the school committee and the new business manager to help get the school committee and the budget back in the block. So I would say definitely um, on that part as a, from a business perspective, I have an MBA in business with a specialization in accounting, so I'm good with numbers too. Um, something he might need to improve on, I would say communication and um, enforcing um, same standard of performance amongst all his administrators within his school system, within the school district. Same level of expectations for all of them and how they inter how each, each school staff works and relates to within each of their schools. I think they all should be at, evaluated at the same level of expectation. Thank you. Um, I agree that um, when Dr. Lang came on board, um, he was um, able to kind of uh, right the ship financially um, and uh, to reestablish um, uh, ourselves um, in the black, as, as Jamie said. Um, I think that in the three years that he's been here, um, not only has he um, reestablished um, us financially and got us moving in a forward direction, um, I think that he's also been able to bring, uh, with the school committee's help, a full day kindergarten online as well as uh, provide extra, very much needed extra space uh, through the modular classrooms. Um, I think he's been tasked uh, with many big projects um, over the last three years and I think, that, um, I think that he's handled them, I think he's handled them well. In terms of areas of improvement, um, I think that uh, one of the areas that I would like to see him um, stress more um, over the next couple of years is curriculum development. 
I think education is changing, technology is changing, and we need to be able to do uh, what it is that we can in order to be able to provide students with the best opportunities to be prepared for college or gainful employment upon leaving high school. I also agree with Jamie that I think that there has to be um, standards um, and uh, maybe um, even something along the lines of a, um, a procedural man man manual in order to be able to help um, there be consistency across all of the schools. So for example, um, that maybe there has to be some standards set around communication and how, um, what the timeline will be for response uh, to a parent's concern. And I think that if we can do that, if we can establish those, uh, those levels of consistency and those levels of standards, it will rebuild the trust and the faith uh, that the community can have in the schools. Thank you. Okay, uh, Donna, you'll be first on this question. What is your view on combining the February and April vacations into one long March vacation? Well, I think um, certainly this, uh, this particular winter has been very difficult, and I think that it is time for us to take a look at other options. Um, certainly the um, uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, is taking a look at this as well, and this is one of the reasons why um, they've looked at um, what we call blizzard bags or really alternative structured day learning. Um, but as, as far as the, common, uh, the, the uh, consolidation of the vacations, um, I think that there's a few things that we would have to do. Uh, one is, is um, there's an awful lot of uh, retesting done in March uh, with regards to MCAS. And I think that, you know, if we're going to do this, I think we would have to work with the state in order to be able to figure out what these assessment schedules would look like. Um, so it's not really just a matter of combining uh, vacations, but it's a really a matter of making sure that when we, if we were to take that as an option, that we were looking at all of the other things that might be impacted on that. Um, families, as I said, um, assessments, college visits um, happen quite a bit in April, uh, not usually in March. Um, all of these things I think would need to be taken into account before we could um, make that decision. And I think one of the things that we would need to do is also to reach out to communities who have tried this before and kind of get their opinion about what they think uh, as to whether or not this is a viable option. Thank you. Jamie? And I've answered this question before already too, and I, I think it's a viable option to eliminate the February and April and have a, a week in March. Um, again, a data analysis does need to be conducted to ensure how we're affecting the educational environment and opportunities of our children. But, and I know that there has been some research um, about the reduction of germs and flu and spreading of viruses, which is one of the reasons why they have these two separates. But I don't know if that is, does that statistically prove to be more beneficial than say, let's have consecutive weeks of educational training. I don't think the class has had a solid week of school since Christmas. Who, what child is getting a good education when they, as soon as they get started into a rhythm, bam, stop. And then it's another break, another vacation, a half day or early dismissal. So I think we really need to look at the benefits of actually doing one in March as opposed to two and how having that consecutive educational experience for the kids and the improvement it will make on their learning opportunities and capability of retaining the information they're actually learning about. Thank you. At this point, we are going to allow the candidates to ask each other questions. So now is the time for you to focus on your television. We are broadcasting live on Chelmsford Telemedia. Or get closer to your radio. We are broadcasting on 980 WCAP. Donna, you have the honor of asking uh, the first question. All right. Uh, Jamie, can you name a teacher that inspired and motivated you and um, what it was that they did um, that uh, encouraged you to learn? Honestly, no. It's sad, but like I said when I started, I went to 12 different schools before I even made it to high school. 
So for me, I, I'm lucky I barely remember my English teacher. I do remember my English teacher, Ms. Rocca. I barely remember her, though, because when I was in high school, I was actually working two jobs at the same time to support myself. Mm -hmm. So I did not have your typical get to go to school experience, which I think, and I work very hard to ensure my children have. Okay. Thank you. Jamie, you have the opportunity to ask Donna a question. I, I honestly don't really have any. I think she's really shared a lot about why she's doing this and her background. I mean, she's, she's a good candidate, either way you look Thanks, at Jamie. it. So I think the Chelmsford people have a hard decision to make on April 3rd. But you know, if there's anything else you want to share. No. Remember, only one of you can be elected. <laughs> I don't think Chelmsford would be at a loss either way. All right, then uh, it would be very appropriate during this round for me to ask a question that came from the audience. And um, this is to each of you, and um, Jamie will answer first. What differentiates you from uh, the other candidate running for a school committee? Why you? <clears throat> well, I'm sure many of you will say because, well, what differentiates me is the fact that I haven't been teaching for 30 plus years, or I haven't lived in Chelmsford for 20 plus years, or I'm still a stay-at-home mom with three young children and people think that's gonna take up a lot more of my time and inability to commit. But I'll tell you what does make me different. My level and training and experience as a leader to get things done at multiple levels. Time management, task organization, and prioritizing to get things done. And I'm able to look at and know how to do short and long-term planning. Yes, short time fixes could be detrimental in the long run. And I think we need to start forward planning the decisions we're making within our school district. It may look good now, nice little pretty Band-Aid, but what's it gonna be like in three years? How is it gonna cost us in five years? And then again, my leadership. I don't need to know everything about everything. We have school committee members who have been longtime educators, but we also have a body of teachers who are in the classroom every day. We have administrators, we have specialists, we have the special education commit, commuted committee, we have the Chelmsford's Council School Committee with the PTOs. We have all of these resources to us since we need someone who can bring them together to work together as a cohesive team. I think pulling all those resources and all that talent together effectively to reach the goals we need to make this educational opportunity for our children the best that Chelmsford can provide. And I think that's what makes me different. I think that's what I can bring to the table. Thank you, Jamie. Donna? Well, I, I think that uh, certainly being a teacher um, gives me a, a different perspective on um, the needs of uh, the teachers in the classroom, but also as a parent and having had two kids who have gone through uh, the Chelmsford Public School System, I have a perspective of being able to see it from top to bottom. Being uh, in town for 20 years, I certainly had an opportunity to be able to get to know a lot of people and to understand how things uh, work here in town. And I think that um, it's that institutional knowledge and my background in teaching that is going to make me a very uh, viable candidate. I would say that I also have leadership skills. As a matter of fact, I don't know many teachers that don't have leadership skills. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to line up 24 first graders, but it takes a lot of leadership skills in order to be able to do that. Um, and so I think that um, the type of forward planning, um, the type of um, organization, the type of structure, uh, the type of professionalism um, and uh, the type of um, uh, teamwork um, that um, is necessary for a school committee, I think that you will also find um, that I have those skills um, based on my experience as a teacher. I don't think teaching is an easy job these days. As a matter of fact, I can't think of much that's more difficult than, uh, than teaching um, because there's so many things that have to be considered. And I think as a, a, a teacher, um, and as someone who's also um, you know, worked to advocate for uh, greater funding for our schools, I see a lot of the problems um, inherent um, in, uh, you know, in, our, in our education system um, today. And I believe that I can help to be able to address some of those issues 
um, through um, an understanding, as I said, of what happens in the classroom, an understanding of um, the various boards and committees here in town and how we all need to work together, um, and um, uh, an understanding of what advocacy needs to happen at the state level in order to be able to um, increase um, revenue for Chelmsford um, so that we don't have to take a look at doing things like an override or cutting services. Thank you. All right, uh, next, Donna, you'll go first. What votes or actions of the school committee lately have you disagreed with? How would you have voted or acted and why? Okay, let me think here. Uh, I would say, I know this is going to sound um, maybe ironic in a way, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, but uh, back in May of uh, 2015, I actually uh, sat before the school committee and I told them that they should not hire Dr. Lang outright. I told them that I thought that they should go through the screening process because after everything that we had been through uh, with the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, uh, that we owed it to the town uh, to have a very thorough screening and vetting process for a new superintendent. Um, so I, you know, that is one thing that, you know, I guess going back uh, to, um, as we kind of turned the corner that I, I disagreed with, this, with the school committee on. Um, I, was, um, I was very much on the fence about full day kindergarten. I was concerned about um, the uh, stress levels that we put on our kids academically these days. Um, however, um, I do believe that uh, the full day kindergarten program has found a nice balance of um, both um, academic skills, uh, social and emotional development. Um, I was also concerned about the uh, modulars. Um, I was concerned about what uh, they would do in terms of um, a potential new construction in town with the uh, School Building Association and what the um, impact would be on our statement of interest that we submitted uh, to that board. Um, but there was one, something that happened at um, town meeting uh, when we were taking that vote that really resonated with me. And it was a father who got up whose uh, daughter was in kindergarten. And he said that uh, his daughter had 28 kids in the class. And I realized that that was no way for a child to begin their education. And so um, even though initially I was n not in favor of the modulars, I realized that uh, you know, we really have to uh, establish a solid foundation for kids, um, you know, to be able to build on as they go through the schools. Um, and so um, I thought that uh, although it was a short-term solution, it may have been the best one in the end. Thank you. Jamie? Well, as you all know, I've only been in Chelmsford since September of 2017, so I haven't had the long history of being here to actively advocate. Um, I will say that of what I have seen since being here that I've questioned, however, the decision was already made. Dr. Lang's salary, his contract, the fact that he was renewed for another three years, or I'm correction, another five years on top of his three-year contract. But again, already done. Under, you know, so, And then um, I think another thing I had concerns about was the addition of two assistant principals for the four schools, four half-time positions, you know, two people to serve, as opposed to looking at what we could have done more so, if possible, to help deal with the social and emotional um, support resources that our, our children seem to be in, in such desperate need for as well. So, and I did ask, you know, how did this, how did this come to be? You know, where is this determined what the priorities are? Because in my opinion, I think we need to look and ask our teachers, what do you need? What do the kids need? And then how do we budget for that? We had to make some tough, you know, Dr. Lang and the school committee had to make a lot of tough calls, cut some um, positions uh, because of the budget situation that they came into when he started. Now we're in a position where we can start looking at adding to the services and supports. So are we prioritizing how, where are we getting that information to prioritize what is going to be added or incorporated back into uh, our school district? Thank you. I saw a blank card. We're good. What's that? <laughs> I'm trying to look in the mood a little bit. 
Um, and we'll start with you, Jamie. Do you feel that the schools have an adequate system for working with students with developmental delays, emotional disorders, or special needs? If no, how can we work to improve? Okay, so um, my middle child is on an IEP with CHIPS, so I do have some firsthand experience in dealing with this, the IEP system. Um, I think we have a good foundation that can always definitely be need improving on. Um, I did hear recently that a particular position was vacant uh, for an extended period of time, which delayed people's IEPs, students' IEP reports or filing of the report or, or however, whatever this particular person, whatever this particular position is. And I believe, you know, something we learned in the Army, you can always work one up and two down. So if someone is vacant in that position, there should already be someone to cover down and fulfill those duties while that position is vacant so that our children aren't delayed in getting the services that they need. And I have, I've seen that and I've, um, I've been told, that we've had parents experience that. So I think that is definitely one area where we need to look at cross-training. So if a position does become vacant, that that position, the tasks of that position aren't neglected, in which case would cause our students to be neglected in the needs that they are requiring for learning. I think the other thing we need to look at again is resourcing our, our, our special needs and looking at what we can do so that we can reduce our out of district students and make what we have available here more accommodating to our own children. Thank you, Donna. Could you repeat the question, please? Yes. Do you feel that the schools have an adequate system for working with students with developmental delays, emotional disorders, or special needs? If not, how can we work to improve it? So yes, I, I do think that um, I do think that we have a, a solid system. I think that people need to remember that um, special education is uh, is law driven. So there are timelines and laws that uh, are in place that will actually dictate the process of determining eligibility um, and um, timelines around IEPs, um, evaluations, and, and the like. I think one of the things that we need to do is to take a look at our coordinated review. We just received that back from the Department of Education and find out what recommendations they would, had made to us uh, that we need to implement in order to be able to improve our services. One of the things that's recently come um, online this year um, is um, CPAC, which is the uh, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And I think this is going to be a tremendously helpful group to parents in terms of understanding their rights and the best ways to go about advocating for what their children need. Generally, special education is a very, very broad area. And so sometimes it's really hard to um, be able to service all of, all of the children's needs. Um, in the IEP process, you always start with what does a child need, and then you determine where are those services going to be delivered. I think we need to provide as many services as we can here in Chelmsford, but I don't think it's realistic that we can provide all services. But I think we need to make um, every effort to make sure that whatever services a child needs, that they have them so that they can be successful and live a quality life and be prepared uh, for um, future employment or whatever comes next after high school. Thank you. All right, next, Donna, you'll go first. Do you think the current graduation requirements are realistic and applicable for students heading to college? I, so there's, there's two, two th issues here. Um, the first is graduation requirements, and then the other would be course of study. So, um, you know, the, the graduation requirements are determined by the state, and there, while there is some flexibility at the local level, there is certain things that have to happen in order for a student to be able to obtain um, a um, high school diploma. Um, in terms of, um, you know, course um, requirements or course selection, um, I think one of the things that we need to do is uh, we need to take a look at uh, what our course offerings are. 
Um, and so in other words, what I mean by this is, is that uh, you know, some students may be interested in going into the math and sciences. And if that's the case, then maybe we should have established pathways for them um, as they um, enter into high school so that they can look at courses that are uh, more geared towards their interest. Well, I think it's very important that high school provides a well-rounded education and lots of opportunities for exposure to kids. I mean, I think some kids know that, uh, you know, I'll use my daughter as an example, because um, it's the best example I have. Um, it, you know, she was very interested in science and math. And while she certainly enjoyed band and, and the performing arts, she knew that that was not going to be a career that she would be entering. Um, and so um, I think that we have to be able to allow for adjustments um, in the credit requirements so that students can focus on certain pathways um, that will allow them to be prepared for college. I think one of the other things that we need to do um, in terms of preparing kids for college or employment after high school is to make sure that they have the necessary um, either skills, um, social skills and emotional skills for college life or employment, um, as well as some real life skills around um, you know, being able to take care of themselves once they leave, either to live on their own or to live away at college. Thank you. Jamie? I've always said that in school you get two things. You get the educational lessons and you get life lessons. And I, be, I believe with Donna what she said that I think in a high school, especially in our high school environment, we need to make sure that we are molding and, and mentoring the students to become self-sufficient. So when they step over into that college campus, can, what can they expect? The teachers are not gonna be holding their hands and, and the teachers won't be giving them latitude in certain areas. The standard of performance is gonna be stricter and, and held, upheld more rigid. So I think we really need to make sure that as the child progresses through the school system, especially in the high school in those four grades, as they progress from freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, are we as teachers, as educators, and as parents progressing to ensure we're molding them to become more self-sufficient, understand and know what the educational environment is gonna be when they go to college, or if they do decide to go straight into the workforce, do they understand how and are prepared to live on and support themselves? I think the course curriculum and courses offered do need to be um, well, uh, diverse, but reasonable, not uh, f what we would call fluff courses. They need to be d worthwhile educational programs to expose our children to. Some people go to high school not knowing what they want to be. Do we have what we need to expose that child to enough so that him, him or her can pick out that niche that they want, that will, they're going to grow a desire to work in or, or become educated in? And then lastly, having that guidance counselor that checks and balance um, from a student who's getting that f more and more freedom as they progress through and picking their courses to making sure that they, they're staying on that right path and they are picking the right classes um, and making sure that they are in fact getting prepared and understand what is going to be expected of them as they progress to the next level, whether it be straight into the workforce or straight into uh, the college life. Thank you. All right, at this point, uh, we're going to take um, a question from the press. And uh, is there another member of the press uh, present? I do want to uh, let everyone know, you are tuned to the Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee candidates debate. The Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee is committed to good government and um, Local elections in Chelmsford are nonpartisan. We encourage folks to not only turn out to vote, but to choose the candidate that you think will best serve the town and ourselves. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Joe Reddy, representing 980 WCAP. Mr. Reddy. How do you feel about Chelmsford's relationship with the Chopa Tech? And uh, I believe that uh, it would be Jamie first. You know, I've heard kind of both sides of that relationship because they're taking money from us or they're costing us more money. Um, in the long run, honestly, I believe in a vocational school. 
if that's what that student wants and that student is ready to go into the workforce and graduate with their technical degree and go right into the workforce, then we should not be restricting, resisting, or preventing that student from going to what, in a field that's gonna make them a positive contributing member of society. Donna? Um, I also believe that there's a real need for um, uh, vocational technical high schools, and I'm glad that we have such a high quality program in Neshoba Tech right here um, locally. Um, I think that um, it is important for kids uh, beginning uh, to decide what it is that they want to do um, with their high school experience to be able to have the opportunity to be able to go over and tour Neshoba Tech and understand what it's all about. Um, and you know, as they begin to make that decision, as I said, for what it is that they're looking from their high school experience. I think Neshoba Tech and, um, you know, Chalmers for High School, while there are certainly uh, similar academic standards, obviously Neshoba Tech offers um, more uh, training uh, in the, in the uh, vocational technical fields. Um, I think that um, that's great uh, for kids who have an interest in that. For kids who don't have an interest in that, and who want more of a traditional high school experience, one of the things that's available to um, Chelmsford for High School students upon graduation is to take, do postgraduate work at Neshoba Tech. I believe it is um, with no cost. Um, so that that way, um, as I said, a kid who wants that traditional experience, but decides maybe at the end of four years um, that they um, you know, want more, rather than going on to college, would like to um, get more um, specific skills training, now have the option of going to Neshoba Tech. So I think that they, they do fill a, a very important um, need in our community. Thank you. Donna, we'll start with you. How do you feel about moving pickup points for children regarding busing? I, I think that um, what we need to do is, you know, obviously this would need to gear towards um, the age of the student. Um, I think that uh, when they're younger, I think uh, a pickup point closer to their home um, is um, absolutely necessary. I believe in kindergarten they do um, door to door uh, drop-offs, and I think that that's, I think this is a great way to ease kids in um, to the school experience. I think as they get older, I think, you know, especially in, in high school and things like that, I think that we could probably, um, um, you know, expand upon um, the pickup points and so that they're not so close together and uh, that the kids could, um, you know, walk a little bit more distance than they may currently do at this point. Thank you. Jamie? I agree. Um, closer to home when they're younger. I, again, getting them to their proper bus stop when they get older is part of instilling and building that level of responsibility. And obviously, um, Chelmsford is very good at looking at snow. Um, and if they're not able to properly clear sufficiently for the safe passage of our children, then they do a delay or um, a close of school, um, looking at that safety perspective. So I think it goes along with that path of starting to instill a level of responsibility in our, in our youth as they get older. So, and, and yeah. Thank you. And uh, we're going to have another opportunity for candidate to candidate questions. And um, I'm hoping that each candidate has thought of a question and we're going to start with uh, Donna, a question for Jamie. Um, a couple of years ago, we um, underwent a uh, comprehensive um, uh, facilities uh, review. And um, through the visioning sessions, um, uh, one of the, two of the options that we considered was either a new middle school um, or a new high school. Um, do you have a preference uh, for uh, either one and why? Well, I mean, obviously you'd have to look at data. What is our student count gonna be like? What's our class load gonna be like? And what are the current statuses of the buildings? Which I'm sure this is already, was done in this report. I would have to say if all else were equal, I would say a new high school would be preferable based on what our current condition is and making sure that our high school students are getting exposed to the latest teaching tools because that's what they're gonna see in college. So if we're doing chalkboard and, and chalk here at Chelmsford and they're going into whiteboards and electro, you know, electronic uh, digital pathways, then we're doing a disservice 
and preparing them for that. So I would think um, if, if, the, if all else were equal, ensuring that our high school is definitely at the same level of educational environment that they're going to receive at the college level, if that's the route they choose to make, so that they're exposed to all learning, possible learning tools and opportunities and become equipped, become experienced, and become successful with those tools. So when they go into college, that's one less thing that's going to shock them. Because they are going to get shocked when they go to college. Anyone who's ever been knows you're going to get a shock. So if we can prepare them and kind of ease that just a little bit, I think a high school as opposed to a middle school would definitely be something I would choose. Thank you. Once again, I want to thank uh, the audience for providing us with so many questions. Uh, we're down to uh, uh, our last couple of questions, but we have time. If there are any last minute questions, please send them forward. A reminder, uh, you are tuned to the Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee's candidates uh, debate. The uh, town committee meets the last Thursday of each month. Uh, we're usually meeting at Princeton Station. We promote good government and uh, encourage you to come join the party. For more information, contact us at w-e-t-h-s-u at a-o-l dot com. That is, we eat this happy stuff up at a-o-l dot com with Sue. And uh, not only do we promote good government, <laughs> we have a sense of humor. Uh, you're tuned to Chelmsford Telemedia and 980 WCAP. Oh, Jamie first? No, she, she, oh, did you have a question? Yes, I'm sorry. I interrupted. <laughs> Your turn to question um, Donna. We thought we'd give you time this time to come up with your question. I've been thinking. I can multitask. Yeah. I can multitask. You're there. Donna. Yes. What do you think I have that would be a good asset to the school community, school committee? I'm going to answer to the school community, um, which is what I think you asked me first. Um, I think you have a... I think you have a, a real drive and a, a, a real passion to become involved um, in, in the town. And I, and I think that's really admirable, um, uh, given that you've uh, lived here uh, for you know, just two years, to jump right into something like this is, um, is, is quite courageous. Um, I know people that have lived here for 40 years who wouldn't make this leap. Um, and so I think that um, I think that as time goes on, I think that you will uh, you will have a great deal to contribute, um, and I think that um, I will look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is a yes or no question, so we really do want yes or no. They don't exist. Donna, do you feel the superintendent deserves a two hundred eight thousand dollars salary? Maybe. No, it's good. <laughs> For those of you not in the room, the uh, that that's Dennis Reddy who keeps things uh, right on uh, right on target. You know, I, let me preface it by saying this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a very complicated question, and I think whenever we reduce something to yes or no, then we run the danger of not having all of the information available. And um, uh, misinforming um, maybe the community um, as to what the reasons behind certain things might be. Let, let me try this. No, the answer is no. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, seriously, <laughs> no. Okay. So the answer was no. Jamie? No. Okay. And um, Jamie, we start with you. How can we improve our ranking across the state for schools? Chelmsford wasn't in the top 100. Well, there are certain criteria that are in our control and certain rating criteria that are not in our control. Level of diversity, uh, English language learners, um, things of those nature, we can't control what our population is. 
<clears throat> how we teach and how well we do on our tests or how successful our students are in preparing for that next level, we can control, we can affect. And I think one of the key things in doing that is gainfully employing and maintaining excellent educators. Now, I've, like I've said before, you don't join public service to become rich. I mean, you become a teacher, you know what you're, you're getting into. You know you're not gonna make a lot of money. I, I joined the Army, I knew I wasn't gonna be a millionaire. It was great every year I got that 1% pay raise or that cost of living raise from the president. It was, you know, it was great, but we knew I, I wasn't gonna make a lot of money. I wasn't gonna be driving around in BMWs and living in mansions. And teachers know that too, especially ones that come in for the purpose of bettering the community they're in for the love of the children. So how do we keep good teachers? We appreciate them. We support them. We provide them the resources they need. And we listen to their concerns. We don't ignore them. And I think having good educators who love what they do will increase the learning ability of our children, and that increased in retaining the educational experience will reflect on the tests, which will reflect on our ratings. That is one area that we can control. Donna? So I think we have to be very careful about these ratings. Um, I'm not sure where this particular rating came from, but sometimes you'll see them in Boston Magazine, US News and World Report, Niche, I mean, there's all different kinds of places that you can see ratings. Um, and each one of them is going to use a different metric for determining you know, how good the school system is. So I think that um, we have to be very careful, as I said, not falling into the trap of um, allowing ourselves to be compared to other school systems based on uh, subjective or you know, not um, realistic uh, measurements. I think um, we do need to continue to hold ourselves to high standards. I think that we should find ways of being able to better evaluate um, our performance um, here as a school system, uh, ones that are reasonable, um, that are objective, um, and that will allow us to uh, gather enough information to continue to develop a high quality school system. Some examples would be, um, for example, we look at you know, kids going into college. All right, that, that's great, okay? What is the percentage of kids that graduate and go on to college? But how many last four years? How many of those students going on to college end up having to take remedial classes because they were unable to pass the assessment or the test uh, needed to get into a college level class to begin with? I think these are the kinds of things that we need to be taking a look at, as well as for students who don't go on to college, you know, after five years, are they gainfully employed? Have they received some skills training? Um, you know, th these are the kinds of things, as I said, that I think that we really need to take a hard look at um, in terms of holding ourselves accountable for the type of education that we're providing. Thank you. All right. Uh, you've been listening to our candidates' uh, debate. And uh, just before we have our closing statements, uh, a uh, quick announcement for those of you that are listening live. Uh, there is a march in Chelmsford Center, a gathering on the common, and then a march, uh, march for safety uh, to uh, honor the uh, 17 who lost their lives at uh, Parkland High School in Florida, 2 p.m. So if you're listening uh, before the 24th, please uh, join us on uh, the common Chelmsford Center, 2 p.m., March 24th. We'll now have our closing statements. And uh, as uh, Jamie went first to open, we will have Donna go first to close. Donna Newcomb. So it's been my pleasure to be here tonight and to be able to answer some questions and allow you the opportunity to be able to get to know me better and where it is that I stand on some of the issues. I've considered running for school committee for many years. Both of my children are recent graduates, as I said, of the Challenge for Public Schools. While they were in school, I was involved in the PTOs, uh, school improvement councils and council of schools, and I've been a teacher for 30 years. I waited till my kids were um, out of school, uh, graduated in 
um, had moved on to college before I decided that I would run for school committee because I felt that I wanted to be able to have the time to adequately fulfill all of the responsibilities of a school committee member. I feel that my teaching experience and my knowledge of the school system gives me a very unique perspective that will help me resolve some of the immediate problems facing the committee, as well as develop a long-range vision for the continued success of our system. Finally, my experience with advocacy at the state level for education, funding reform will enable me to be able to work on behalf of Chelmsford to address issues regarding state aid for our schools. I respectfully ask for your vote on April 3rd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jamie. I would like to echo the same sentiment and thank you for this opportunity, uh, for all the questions. I thought they were great, um, and I hope everyone got a better opportunity to learn the new guy, because I am the new guy, and I completely accept that. But I, I will say this. I chose Chelmsford, and I want to serve Chelmsford. I want to be proactive in my community. Now, why the school committee? because I have children in the school now, and I will have children in this school system for the next 16 years. I am gonna be well invested in what's going on, and as the changes occur within the classroom, within the schools, within the educational experiences, I'm gonna see that, because my kids are gonna be coming home and showing me this stuff. Also, I, have, I may not have the exceptional teaching background as my opponent does, but my leadership allows me to tap those subject matter experts, allows me the ability to know how to bring those subject matter experts together to collaborate on a joint plan to meet our goals. I am running because I want to serve the community. I chose the school committee because my kids are in the school and I'm proactive in their education and I want to ensure that whatever education our community is providing for our children, it is the best possible education we can give them because that is our primary focus. Whatever we do, whatever agency we are, we have to come together to fulfill that goal. And I think I can. Be, I think with my leadership background, I can come in and be able to help get that collaboration. I have a master's in business with a specialization in accounting, so I can look at the numbers and look at and see that doesn't make sense or there's a red flag there. But again, it really comes down to bringing together the people. Since I've been here at Chelmsford, I didn't just wake up one day and say I'm going to be in the school committee. I'm currently the co-treasurer for the Harrington PTO. I'm active in my church at St. John's uh, Catholic Church in North Chelmsford. I'm an active parishioner there. I, co I uh, was assistant coach for my son's soccer league last year, last spring. And I'm active with my son's Cub, uh, Cub Scout troop. So I do do a lot of things. Um, and a lot of people always question, well, how are you going to manage the time with three young children and what this job will require? Well, I ask you this, what, how does every working parent manage the time? It's going to be a full-time job. I'm more than capable of handling a full-time job with three kids. There are plenty of working parents out there who handle a full-time job with three kids. And I can dedicate the time and necessary and I can manage that time. Also, I'd like to say, um, of all the nuances and all the rhetoric that's going on, I'd really like to just focus on how we as a community can improve the school environment, the school, schooling educational opportunity for our children. Again, thank you very much for uh, sitting here and listening and providing your questions and delving into our brains and learning a little bit. I know you guys all know Donna and everything she is, but getting to learn a little bit about me, Jamie Outland Brown, and I do respectfully ask for your vote on April 3rd. Thank you very much. Let's have a big round of applause for these two excellent candidates. You've been listening to the Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee's candidates uh, debate. I think that you'll agree with me. Uh, the, uh, all of the candidates who are running for these two offices, Jamie Outland Brown, Donna Newcomb, for selectmen, Emily Antle, George Dixon, Laura Merrill, we are very fortunate to have candidates such as these uh, vying for our votes to represent us. Uh, in town government. 
Our motto on the uh, Commons says, let the children defend what the sires have won. Guard, I'm sorry. It's Dennis Reddy again. Let the children guard what the sires have won. And uh, it's up to the sires to make sure that our children inherit the good government that we were given. Nothing is more important to defend democracy than to vote. It is truly the frontier of freedom. The election is April 3rd. Please come out and vote. And if you're not inspired by candidates such as these, you haven't been paying close attention. Once again, you're tuned to Chumster Telemedia. On behalf of everyone here, and especially on behalf of the Chelmsford Democratic Town Committee, thank you to Chelmsford Telemedia, and thank you to the Chelmsford Arts Council and Susan Gates for making this beautiful room uh, available to us. And uh, let's have one more round of applause for good government. And may God bless. Amen.